So I want someone to tell me at some point, well now it's 11, can someone like give me a not so subtle sign in half an hour? Okay? Um, so that you can all go to lunch and, uh, and everything works as planned. But before I start with the tutorial, um, there is this box here, which uh, Aiden created and um, decorated in a typically Irish fashion. Um, well, the purpose of this box is to collect anonymous questions from tutors and and students and, uh, well, depending on how successful we are, maybe also other people who are sitting around. Um, questions about the topics that we have addressed at the school. And the idea would be that we collect these topics today and uh, throughout tomorrow during the keynote. And after the keynote tomorrow, we have something like a very informal panel so uh, all the tutors will gather here uh, in the front and we will pick questions and we will spend something like an hour uh, trying to answer them. Um, some of the answers might be less factual than others. So for some of these questions, we might have only viewpoints and, uh, and very... Um, few amounts of empirical evidence, but nevertheless, um, you have a chance if there are technical or less technical things that you feel have not been answered in the most appropriate fashion or at all uh, during these three days of tutorial. Feel free to uh, take a piece of, well, where, where is the paper? So just find some paper. Um, Put, if you want to put your name on the, on, uh, below the question, that's fine with us. You don't have to. And then um, we, tomorrow we have an, uh, one hour to pick some of these questions and, and try to answer them. Okay. Um, I probably already wasted five minutes of my precious time. Building and using ontologies. Um, who has built an ontology already? Okay, one, two, so, so like what, 20%? Um, why did you build it? Well, so what I take from, the, uh, from, from, from this initial discussion is that, um, well, ontologies seem to be uh, quite a popular topic um, and that the creation and usage of ontologies is related to a number of challenges, some of which seem to be technical. Um, using a certain tool, um, encoding in a certain knowledge representation language, uh, encoding, you know, very rich aspects of a domain like restrictions and axioms and the like. Um, other equally important ones seem to be process related. We don't know when to stop in specifying our requirements. Uh, so we have no precise means um, of getting a feeling, and I'm using this phrase on purpose, um, of what is the trade-off between having a very detailed conceptualization early on in the process um, and um, investing some resources in building this, so having my system delivered later, as opposed to, you know, having just um, a very blurry view on the requirements that I would have on the domain. Now, um, the bad news about this tutorial is that I'm not going to talk about any of these challenges that you guys raised. Um, and the reason for that is <laughs> that um, I don't have enough time. And the second reason is um, I, we decided in the team for this year that we are not going to give a classical ontology engineering tutorial. There are books about that. Um, there are also um, slides from the previous summer schools that you can find wherever you find all the other slides. Uh, so there is a second set of slides, um, ESWC something something 2012 ontologies. Uh, this, is my, this is my three hours talk that you will find there. And this walks you through the whole requirements analysis, blah, 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 blah process, yeah? Uh, for this tutorial, I'm gonna go just into the conceptualization phase with some very specific issues because um, we are trying to uh, do applied ontology engineering applied to the linked data management cycle. Um, okay, 
what is this slide about? Ontologies in computer science, you know, you know about this. Yeah, so an ontology is uh, talking about a domain. You don't talk about an ontology without any reference to a certain domain. This domain can be very narrow, can be very broad, can be very abstract, can be very, very concrete, very personal, anything. But you have a domain. And then you identify in this domain a number of things. Some of these things may be more abstract than others. These are the so-called classes, yeah? Classes stand for sets of similar things that share certain properties, yeah? Um, then you can put these things in relation to each other, yeah? You can describe what kind of um, uh, uh, characteristics and attributes they have. And the result is an ontology. Uh, there are similar other things in computer science and in other sciences that have um, a, a similar purpose, which is to share this common understanding about the domain between people and machines. And on the slide, on the left-hand side, you just see some names you can use. Uh, you've heard about vocabularies, linked open vocabularies, yeah? Um, does anyone, can anyone explain why all of a sudden we stopped talking about ontologies and we started using the term vocabulary instead in this community? And exactly. Um, so now people, it turned out that people are not so scared anymore. So ontologies come back into fashion. But like three years ago, you had the holding data going, no, we're not building ontologies. And this was for historical reasons, because the way this community evolved, we started by building ontologies. Remember when John was telling you on Monday, don't build the ontology for five years and then, then do the rest. But this is what we've done. So everyone was, from, from outside the community, was kind, was kind of scared. Right, so there are other things as well, topic maps, schemas, classifications, and then these are what they called modeling primitives, ontological primitives. Again, they have different names, depending on uh, in which community you're in. And in this, um, in this tutorial, I will use uh, some terms interchangeably, just to make the point that this is not a tutorial about knowledge representation, this is not about a certain language, and you can encode knowledge, but it is about how you identify the things that matter to you in the domain and how you describe them. And um, just as a disclaimer, there are lots of challenges related to encoding in itself, yeah? So pay attention to that. Um, many languages look very, or, or paradigms, look very similar on the first sight. So you might say, oh yeah, that's just UML, object-oriented programming. They have classes, I have classes in OWL. Uh, they have objects, I have instances in OWL. Yeah, it's gonna be, I, I'm just gonna, Go there, take my UML diagram and, and encode it in OWL. It's, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that, yeah? And you can have some very interesting surprises if you, if you just go about your UML thing that you've learned in school um, and, and uh, try to do a one-to-one -one translation into OWL. Anyway, that's the classical ontology engineering process, very much like in software engineering. We're not gonna talk about this in the tutorial, but let me tell you, so building ontologies according to that process is not that um, exotic as some people in the linked data community might uh, want to tell you. So in fact, there are a number of projects out there, uh, projects in which significant resources have been invested in building rich conceptualizations of domains in which um, great results have been achieved, um, which demonstrate that if you have the resources, both human resources and, and, and others, to encode knowledge in a machine understandable fashion, to do it in a coherent, consistent way, this can lead to beautiful applications. But it is a matter of when do you need the product and what kind of functionality it should have. So this myth that some of you might have heard about, there are no intelligent ontology-based applications that, that, that show the power of, you know, more or less what we used to know as classic AI, is dead. We have, in fact, a number of very powerful and convincing applications that show what 
Semantic technologies, ontologies in particular, in combination with other technologies can achieve today. So one example is this project Halo, which um, is still running in the US. It started, I think, in 2000. Um, and what they wanted to build is something called the digital Aristoteles which means very rich encoding of common knowledge. And they started by encoding textbooks in chemistry, biology, and something else that I forgot. Um, so I, it showed, so their pilot project was, let's try to encode all the knowledge in a 70 pages um, part of a chemistry handbook. Then they realized this is going to be so expensive and it's going to take ages. So they need to optimize the process. What did they do? They introduced a bit of crowdsourcing um, and they looked into automatic means to extract some parts of the structured knowledge from text and then they built some editors. Yeah? And in the end, one of their showcases, and you can look it up at inquireproject.com, it's this iPad application, which is, which is an intelligent textbook about biology. There is a rich ontology behind it, and you can do wonderful things with that book. Uh, some other projects. Who has heard about Watson? Yeah? Okay, so we know what... And we, we, uh, Watson is like the new cool thing in AI. So it's a question-answering technology, um, which has been developed since 2005 at IBM with um, huge amounts of resources um, and has been showcased in the Jeopardy game in the US. Uh, and is now applied, so this is evolving into a more generic technology that is applied everywhere. So now if you go on the IBM website uh, at Watson, they showcase there what they do in financial management and in many other areas. This is Siri, we know Siri, right? Uh, Siri is using ontologies and many other things that you've heard about at the school. Um, Wolfram Alpha? Yeah? Um, so this is, a, this, is, this is a knowledge base um, that contains not just facts, but also has a very strong computational uh, capabilities in, 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 in the sense that it gives you answers to mathematical questions, functions, uh, to, to, to natural science questions that, that, you, that you have. Um, this is mostly manually encoded, though they do make use of other data sets as well. So, bottom line, if you have good amounts of resources and, and the skills or the experts, access to experts to do that, uh, you can do beautiful things with rich knowledge representations. Um, and there are lots of examples, like the ones that I just introduced, in, which show that in combination with many other things, like natural lang language processing, like speech recognition, like image analysis, semantic technologies can be used and have been used in order to build what we call intelligent applications. And not only that they can be used, they are acknowledged as an essential component. Many data sets, core data sets from the linked open data cloud are used by various parties. Ontologies and, and, and in general formal knowledge representation is used for certain parts of, of the functionality of, of the system. But we have come a long way and we have learned not to present semantic technologies as a, the holy grail of everything. It will just be part of a, of a bigger picture. Um, and I will not go through this, but if you see it on the slide, this is so that biology iPad thingy that I've showed, these are the type of technologies that they're using. You can also have a look at Watson presentations and see how the interplay of different technologies um, served to achieve that functionality that is, that is very impressive, I believe. Okay, so we don't do classical uh, ontology engineering, though that is useful and leads to, among other things, those. Um, our scenario is this one. So it's this uh, uh -huh, that Barry talked about, um, where we have some data and we want to put it into RDF, and at some parts in the process, you have to select your ontology that you're gonna use, and from some parts of your data, you are going to need to extend that ontology. Yeah? Um, so 
This means if you have to extend your ontology, then you will have to decide how you are going to encode the knowledge that you cannot find at the structure level in the ontologies that you use. Yeah? So um, I'm going to do some very simple things with you, like to explain you what is a class, when is a class a class, when is a class not a class, not a class yeah? what is a relationship, and so on and so forth. And then we're going to have, uh, we're gonna have some examples. Right, so if Watson and Wolfram and all the others are examples of how classical ontology engineering is applied or has to be applied in order to, to build ontologies mostly from scratch. You have applications like, um, like the BBC website, which has been mentioned earlier, um, which show a different approach to building ontology. So BBC, they have, they have their own program ontology that they built for their own domain because there was nothing out there to, uh, that they could map to. And then they have reused many other ontologies and there is this presentation, which I love, which is now like two, two years old or so, but still very, very relevant, um, which is called Beyond the Polar Bear. I don't know why it's called Beyond the Polar Bear, but basically what it says, it, it describes the role of information designers and architects at BBC, which is among other things, to build and maintain their ontologies in this linked data world. Yeah, so they have data that describes um, describes the, the domain in which they are operating. They have program descriptions and images um, and, and they want to have a way to organize this information. They also have, they want to integrate other data sources. So they have to have an engineering process for the ontological schemas which are used on the, on the site um, which matches exactly these characteristics. Right, so I'm going to tell you something about popular ontologies. I'm going to tell you where you're likely to find ontologies, how you're going to select it. This is tricky. I mean, no one actually knows how to select them. Um, and I'm going to talk about, about modeling. I am not going to talk about requirements analysis, KR, all the other things. So this is the, uh, the video lecture site from last year. Um, where I talked a bit about these things, and as I said, you also have my previous set of slides. Well, so according to my knowledge, the most popular repository for cross-domain ontologies, or for ontologies in different domains, sorry, seems to be at the moment this linked open data vocabularies. There are also quite a few repositories in the life sciences domain. Most of them with hundreds of different ontologies curated by domain experts. There are also, it's not here, this happens when you, when you create new sets of slides. Uh, there are also repositories of taxonomies and other things that at least give you a sometimes very comprehensive vocabulary of a domain you're looking for, yeah? Um, so, linked open vocabulary, it's, it's uh, the site that uh, Barry introduced uh, yesterday, if I remember correctly. Um, so, they give you an overview of uh, the ontologies that are used in the linked open data cloud. And when, um, what I mean by that is that you can actually search for ontologies containing a certain phrase or, or, or label, using a label in a, in a certain way. So um, basically here I looked for music, yeah? And then uh, it tells me, okay, I find 300 something results in, in, in these 30 vocabularies. So they're basically, they can be anything in a graph, yeah? So they can be subject properties and, and, and objects at, at whatever position whatsoever. Then they have also a classification of ontologies in domains, and they give me uh, this classification for these 36 vocabularies. Um, then they, show, they filter by type, so they found 132 classes and 200 properties that are somehow related to, uh, to this term, I have to say, um, most of these repositories, their search doesn't work very well, so it's 
quite basic, but nevertheless, it's, um, it's still quite comprehensive in terms of the type of, of, uh, of faceted search and exploration navigation that they, that they offer. And it's up to date because it's run by some very passionate people. So I guess, I guess this is as good as it gets and there are several hundred of vocabularies out there which should be enough for most of our purposes. What else can you do with this? So for each vocabulary you have this overview. Uh, there is some basic metadata and you've heard about void. Yeah, uh, void is used to describe data sets in general, but you can also use it to, you know, remember, enumerate important classes, properties, and so on. These are essential components of an ontology. Um, linked open vocabularies have also defined something which is called VOF, vocabularies of a friend. I have no clue how widely used this is. They, so it's a vocabulary to, to basically encode the fact that some ontologies use other ontologies. And again, remember when Barry was warning you that if an ontology is not listed in the void file of a data set, it doesn't mean that, um, uh, that uh, they not make reference or, or link to, 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 to those, yeah? So this is a bit more, more explicit, goes a bit more explic explicitly in that direction. So you have metadata, la, 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 la. Uh, then you have which data sets are using this vocabulary, yeah? 182 for FOV. Then you have some, uh, some pretty pictures and graphics. And then you have the vocabulary history. Um, which can give you some information about, you know, how stable the vocabulary is on the one side, but also it gives you information about um, how often do changes occur, yeah? Because you want, if you use a vocabulary and you start, um, for instance, annotating your content with it, and this seems to change every Friday, then you might want to wait until a certain point in time, until, you know, a stable version is achieved, because every time they change things, you might have, this might, might uh, uh, create some overhead for you as well, yeah? So this is all useful information, which will also help you in selecting the right ontology. So this is another tool um, that was developed in a, in a European project, which is called LOD2. This is the project. The name of the tool is LOD Stats, um, which tries to give you some quantitative measuring of uh, the state of the cloud. Um, and they do this also for vocabularies. Um, they are used, so the functionality is also used on, 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 the, on the LOV side that I just explained. Okay, now quickly, is it, what time is it? I must, until 12? Ah, oh, oh, oh. Okay, yes, perfect. Okay, um, so right, what have we done so far? So there are these two ways of creating ontologies, the more linked data friendly way and the classical way, both have addressed specific scenarios with some value. And now we're gonna do the second one because we want to have an aligned program and you learned a lot about linked data and um, we, we thought it's just a good fit. So in this world, we are in the scenario in which <laughs> You have the data and you want to expose it as RDF. So you want to know in good linked data fashion which vocabularies are out there. So you go to the linked open vocabularies, you look up some concepts that you know are important to you and you try to narrow down the number of vocabularies you want to use, yeah? These are some typical examples of vocabularies that are very popular. I will not discuss why a vocabulary becomes more popular. It can be because of historical reasons. It can be because it's very generic and the knowledge it covers. It can be because it's very small, thus easier to understand. It can just be that the author is a very, has a very loud voice or it has been published at the right moment. You never know. All vocabularies have their flaws on the modeling side all vocabularies um, express a certain viewpoint of a certain group of people, sometimes larger, sometimes smaller, upon the domain of interest. There will always be alternative 
conceptualizations of the same domain. What is much more easier and straightforward to establish is whether a vocabulary is flawed um, at the encoding level. Whether you use something like OWL or RDFS in a way that leads to unintended consequences or, or that leads to, you know, uh, stating facts that are simply and bluntly wrong in the domain of interest. Even then, there are situations in which you might have to cut corners and use certain language primitives in a different way than it was defined by its designers or specified in the standard. It's just shortcuts because of technical reasons, performance at the application level, and so on and so forth. But let's say that type of mistake is much more easier to find out. Okay, having said that, let's see what ontologies are out there. Dublin Core, everyone knows this. Use it. Friend of a friend, we know this as well. So what is, what is like, what are the best practices to use friend of a friend? What are the, the typical mistakes that someone makes? Aiden, don't look, you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead. Then there's mbox, then there's, uh, um, so the way full files are created, for instance, um, leads to certain parts of full profile, profile being wrongly copy and pasted and transferred into other people's personal descriptions. Um, so you have something, I think there was something like a, a website, like example.org or something like this that came up as being the website of everyone on the on the internet. Um, so there, there these best practices that you should be aware of and if you just um, search through the older discussions on, 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 on the popular mailing list, you will, you will find them. Okay, who has a file? file? A file profile? Why do you have one? Experimenting. Experimenting. Oh, so we, we like to experiment. DBpedia. We know what DBpedia is about, yeah? So, um, Aiden can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, in, according to, to my knowledge, it's one of those data sets which is uh, most up-to-date um, and, and, and maintained in the, in the entire cloud. Uh, so these people will put lots of effort into making sure that whenever there are Wikipedia edits in the info boxes, they get transferred, at least in the English, week, in the English version of DBpedia. Uh, and then every couple of times a year, they actually have public releases um, of, uh, of a new version of both the schema and, and, and the data behind it. Uh, then there's Freebase. You've heard about this as well. Right. Uh, this is the ominous shock. Semantically interlinked online communities. Um, a couple of years back, there was this fashion to try to use semantic technologies on top of social media. Um, for Twitter data, for um, bibliographic sites like, like Delicious, in combination with almost any type of social data you could get your hands on. Hence, not on Facebook. I haven't seen any papers about semantic Facebook or something. Um, so, in semantic blogging, have you heard about Zemanta? Yeah, um, there was there was there was a trend a couple of years back. People were trying to to uh, to do this, and um, as a result, one of the results of these um, series of activities was this vocabulary that basically describes uh, the most important types of artifacts you would have if you would say, build some sort of semantic search on top of Twitter or wanting to 
do user profiling on top of Twitter data or um, annotate blog posts in a semantic way and then recommend, I don't know, related posts or something like that, yeah. Um, so this is started in Derry and then was uh, continued as a community effort and um, is pretty much the standard vocabulary you would use when you do anything at the intersection of social and, and semantics. And there, there are um, lots of extensions. So I've seen here uh, people working in a project I used to be associated with, which is called Renda, which is about knowledge diversity. Um, and they have, for instance, something um, which wants to encode opinions and sentiments and views upon, uh, upon certain facts. Um, so they have a much richer conceptualization um, of this domain, but nevertheless, they make use of many um, of the concepts in shock. SCOS, which is the Simple Knowledge Organization System. Again, it was Barry made it quite clear how this should be used and what it is and what is not. Um, description of a project. I have no clue who created this and who is using it, but apparently it is used. Aiden, do you have more information? Uh, yeah, that's all I know. Um, right, so it's used. Have a look at it. It's simple to understand. The music ontology, we know music ontology. The 300 ontologies in life sciences and healthcare. Then there's WordNet. There is actually an OWL version of, of, of WordNet available. Um, so you could do your NLP research. And if you want to add some semantic magic on top, here we go. I have my feeling is, if I'm not misinformed, that that version is not the most up-to-date according to, to WordNet, but nevertheless, uh, the changes in the English language are not that fundamental um, that uh, from, a, from year to year that you, um, that, you know, you cannot use the version that is available. Schema.org, you've heard about that as well. Good relations, who knows what good relations is? Who can tell me what good relations is? What, what you're describing is this classical, semantically enhanced e-commerce scenario, um, which um, was attempted to be implemented in a more or less convincing fashion in many, many times. And then Martin Hepp came along and he actually created this good relations ontology that is inspired by e-commerce standards like E-Class um, um, and UPSRC. Um, and he actually was willing and prepared to put the effort into creating an ontology that is maintained and documented and put lots of efforts into, into promoting it to, to various retailers and, and other types of stakeholders. And uh, then schema.org came along. Um, and now there are actually mappings from good relations to, to schema.org to leave this topic in a more positive way. Um, additional resources, I mentioned that before, so these are just two examples of taxonomies. Yeah. Um, can someone explain me in two sentences what the difference is between a taxonomy and an ontology? So what did we hear? We, he we heard it's just a hierarchy and it's not the semantics of the properties is not formally defined. I'm still missing one or even two um, differences. Um, no one tells you in a taxonomy that the property that is used is Isa. You can have part of tax you can have any type of property used to build the tree. Yeah? So, okay, the things that are more or less, more or less accepted are it's just a hierarchy, it doesn't have to be Isa, and it's, it means whatever, yeah? I'm not sure about it, but I would say, I would say they would not, they build a taxonomy in order to classify something, so they would have some sort of objects classified according to the taxonomy. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so this concept of instance is not so, 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 so explicitly defined, you're right, yeah. Uh, and sometimes taxono taxonomy terms are just used to identify certain things. Like, you know, you have medical taxonomies that are just used as a code to identify a disease. Fair enough. Okay, so I have no idea what algorithm I could 
give you to select the most appropriate ontology in a, in a given area, yeah? Um, but I can give you a couple of pointers. Um, so if you're in the classical scenario, the old-fashioned one, um, then you want to really consider what the ontology you are building is going to be used for and by whom. Um, and compare that scenario with whatever you can find out about the ontology you're considering reusing. Um, for instance, there are things that, you, that might not be so obvious, like do you actually need a certain type of natural language interface to your ontology and in which natural language, yeah? So if you're building something, whatever kind of interfaces you're building, that will accept some user input and then do some sort of matchmaking from, then, from that user input to the labels and to the lexicalization of your ontology, you want to make that very, very efficient, yeah? So you need certain types of labels in a certain way, in a certain language, and so on and so forth, yeah? Um, what kind of reasoning, for instance, do you want to, do you want to support in your application? So, um, and related to that, what kind of knowledge representation constraints do you have with respect to the ontologies you would want to reuse? What level of expressivity is required? So um, concept-based similarity measures on top of this DBpedia schema are likely to be not very useful because your schema is like this and you want something like this. You want to have lots of levels. You want to have um, um, very balanced class hierarchy so that you can distinguish between different types of concepts and so that these path measuring that you're basically doing with your concept-based similarity is fine-grade enough to make a difference. Yeah, so flat, if you have if you aim to do any type of, uh, of concept-based similarity, don't look for flat things, yeah? Uh, what you're gonna reuse, just the vocabulary, good idea, but if you reuse more, then there is um, more, much more effort involved. Who is going, how are you going to reuse it? Who is going to use the ontology? So every time you reuse something, you actually have a dependency um, to, to an external source, and we had this discussion also in the context of the of, of, of uh, linked data sets as well. Um, other things that are not here, how popular an ontology is and tools like this uh, LOV uh, thing can, can give you some idea about that. Um, though, in honesty, there is, they're not very transparent in terms of how they actually measure popularity. And, um, but anyway, try to see how much the ontologies are used. Try to see what data is out there. Uh, try to see how frequent the updates are and try to find out why. Is this because they cannot make up their mind or is it because actually it's a lively community? Um, and then just use your common sense and ask other people. This also helps as well. By the way, this public LOD mailing list is very helpful. People, they will share their thoughts and ideas with you if you want it or not. So whenever you have questions like this and you have given some thought and you're still not sure which option to take, just go to the mailing list and ask. And people will give you lots of suggestions. And most of them will be informed and, 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 uh, and people are very willing to help. Yeah.